Okay, uh, good morning everyone. Uh, I'm Matthew, this is Mike. Mike needs no introduction. Uh, we're both at Wavefront. We've been at Wavefront for about two years. Uh, and we're both on the team that run the service call Wavefront and FoundationDB, and this is our story. Uh, before I talk about FDB, I'll tell you a little bit about Wavefront. We're uh, Silicon Valley's best kept secret. We're a SaaS time series metrics tracing monitoring platform. And one of the few places running FDB at scale. And so because of that, we've learned a lot of things about running it over the last couple of years. And people like us, we have uh, startups and large SaaS co companies as well. So we talked about scale a little bit earlier. We run about 470 instances across 80 clusters. Uh, some of these clusters actually span multiple AWS regions. Um, and that for us is about 330, or sorry, 3,300 uh, FDB processes. Uh, and our largest clusters often exceed about a million writes a second on the memory engine. Uh, since we're all showing off architecture, I'll show you ours. So this is a real simplified view of, of a Wavefront uh, stack. There's three tiers, an application, I'm sorry, web, web tier, an application tier, and then a database tier, and I'll, I'll go into there. Uh, the web servers here run a small three-node key value store running FDB. We share content that's common to both. Uh, Wavefront runs two mirrors, so a primary and secondary mirror. And this, this key value store shares, uh, stores content that's common to both sides of the mirror. So things like alerts or dashboards or user, uh, user names. On the app tier, this is where all the magic happens. We take in telemetry. We do stuff with telemetry. We do queries. We do alerting. And we store it into the database, which is FDB. Uh, on the database side, we run, as I mentioned, we run a memory engine and the SSD engine and a coprocessor. And I'll let Mike talk about the rest there. Yeah, so this is a, a very high level view of how we architect our cluster. Every Wavefront cluster, as he said, is actually uh, two databases. Uh, there we run the memory and the SSD engine. Uh, actually, it'd be easier if I come out here. Uh, on the SSD side, we put a Stripe. Uh, across a set of EBS volumes, just basic GP2 volumes, and we shim in in front of them using Enhance I.O. cache volumes. Those cache volumes we use to cache our reads. Uh, this is important for AWS, and we'll talk about that later. And the writes are, it's just a write-through cache, so the writes actually fall straight through into the EBS volumes. Uh, the memory engine is not using a Stripe. The memory engine has we can kind of take advantage of being a time series database. We know we're always writing to the tip of the database, so we use write throughput optimized. Uh, ST1 disks are actually magnetic volumes, but they're highly tuned for doing sequential reads and writes. Never at the same time, but the uh, FTV memory engine is only ever writing or reading, and it's doing reads during recovery, and it's doing writes during normal operations because your reads come from memory. Um, and in between the two databases, we have on each node what is an FDB uh, coprocessor. So actually, see if I can I have to click over here to advance it. Or how do I advance? Where are you trying to go? Uh, there we go. Um, the FDB coprocessor lives between uh, the uh, or the FDB coprocessor lives between our SSD and our memory engine. And because this isn't like a Cassandra database where it's consistently hashed, it's an ordered key value store, it's performing compression, sorting, optimizations, aligning the data and the boundaries in the database so that we get the maximum reads and writes out. Um, and it's aware of the operating space available to the memory tier. The memory tier is very sensitive to how much space is available to be written into it. So we have our FDB coprocessor that basically can shut down writes to the database, shovel data out, and then resume workloads. And we queue all the workloads up, keep everything durable, so we don't lose anything. Um, we run our databases uh, with a one-to-one -one processor count. Uh, so earlier, uh, we talked about like there were different roles like proxies, resolvers, and logs, and storage. There's these stateful and stateless transaction processes. Those actually aren't like specific things like you have to run. They're a, just a deno on a process that this is a transaction process, and it can be any one of these roles. So we make sure that we have one-to-one -one for storage engines, and transactions are a uh, two-to-one, so we run two storage processes for every one transaction process on the memory tier. Because we're doing such a high volume of writes, we need lots of proxies and resolvers to push into the uh, transaction logs, which are carrying those permutations. 
Um, I'll pass it back to you. All right. Uh, we run on Linux, and yeah. so we've become experts at running on Linux and experts at running in a somewhat hostile virtual environment. Uh, so so, that I, so, so <laughs> we've learned a lot of things on how to, how to tune Linux or the machine we're running on around disk I.O., around CPU and memory, and kernel tuning. Um, so NUMA, it's a thing that no one remembers until Snowflake told us to think about it. Uh, so on multi-CPU instances like the i3, uh, 16x, or 8x, we are, we're pretty prescriptive. We bind a process to a CPU and a memory, so we don't have the CPU thrashing across uh, for memory uh, access. Um, you know, Mike touched on our disk layout a little earlier. We're heavy users of a disk caching called Enhance I.O. We focus mostly on, on read caching, and so we have a one-one mapping between the EBS volume and the instance store itself. Uh, mostly because Amazon doesn't discriminate between IOPS, and so we sort of cheat. We get free read caching I.O. We then have a bunch of extra I.O. for our, our writes. And what this means in practice is you can see the blue line is our read cache rate across one of the, I forget which, one of the larger clusters we have, and then the green is um, the writes, which we don't really cache at all. Yeah, so we get about 100% uh, read caching because we shim an NVMe in front of each one. So the only overhead really on reads is just what it costs in Foundation DB because it's lightning fast. The only cost is also the time it takes to build the cache, which is not very long, about a day or so. We're also experts at tuning the kernel, or we've become experts. Uh, these values work for us in our workload. You should experiment. Um, but this is something that we have done. Yeah, uh, it was really important for us to tune the networking layer on the kernel, especially for the cluster controller. Uh, that's where latency can kill your cluster. It's doing the health checks. It's deciding who's going to take what role and what you know what roles are going to be assigned out. If your kernel isn't tuned well, you can actually flood and DDoS your cluster controller and can take the cluster down. And we're not saying it's ever happened to us. No, but, uh, not on production. <laughs> um, <laughs> But th so it, it was important to make some of these changes so that we could uh, go from being able to run three, four hundred uh, process clusters up to much higher now. Um, we're almost 500, 600 um, on a single cluster uh, just out of turn uh, tuning the kernel so that we uh, get the best performance. That's all you. All right. Uh, so one of the things that's also important uh, if you're going to operate FDB at scale is the instance life cycle. Uh, it's hugely important because we have some clusters that are operating at up to 20 nodes in a cluster. Uh, so being able to ensure that these instances come online and they're ready to go, uh, that they are 100% operational ready is important. Uh, so we use Terraform. We have a system called Landing Party that, is going to, that configures these instances on first boot. Um, and we also use, make heavy use of Ansible so that we can do entire fleet replacements um, at once, which is we want to be able to quickly and easily change out all of the infrastructure. So our database configuration in Terraform is, is dead simple. It's how many nodes, you know, of what type, how much storage do you want on it, what version of Ubuntu are you running? Uh, we were locked to 16.0 for a bit. We've just been unlocked because we had to rewrite some of the uh, Enhance I.O. Uh, cache to support later kernels to get us on to AWS kernels as well. Um, that enables us with just some very simple helper scripts that will go out there and deploy these databases. And of course, because we're observability, it's important for us to be able to immediately see when these nodes come online and how they actually perform uh, and what it means. You can see new memory storage nodes coming online, how much CPU, you can see a spike in the data that was being processed because uh, there was likely a slight backup as the node jo joined. Uh, so honestly, we want to let computers do the hard work for us. So that's what Landing Party does. Uh, we have Landing Party and Post Boot systems. They actually, when a system comes online, they're going to go in there. If it's a brand new cluster, it's going to configure the memory and the SSD tier for us automatically. We don't have to touch it. It just configures new double redundant memory or SSD engines. Uh, it's going to prepare the foundation DB configuration files, like our NUMA settings. It detects, are we on an i3? Is this a 16x or an 8x? Do I need to? 
push out the NUMA configurations. It's going to get everything ready uh, for us so that all we have to do is turn FDB on. That's the one thing we don't do. We don't let it turn FDB on automatically. The instances join, they're prepared, they're ready to roll. Uh, we turn them on with intent. It allows us to stage work. It allows us to prepare a customer to grow their infrastructure and then turn it on under uh, controlled. In the background, there's a process that's taking the cluster config and pushing it into S3 so on launch, we can pull it back out so the machines kind of come up ready to go. Yeah. So we can, yeah, exactly. So the landing party also pulls down that cluster file, so that's uh, synchronized across the, all of the machines, all of the nodes, so that we don't ever have to manage that either, because that, that can be rather error prone. Uh, so fleet replacements, really, let computers do the hard work for you. Uh, the thing with the fleet replacements is it's we need to be able to change the tires on the car, wait, it's to the left, right, yep, while the car is moving. We don't want to have to deal with it. So we have written tooling that actually will go in there and completely replace an entire cluster without any human interaction besides starting it. It goes through, identifies which nodes are to be removed, excludes them, re-coordinates the cluster, checks to make sure the excludes have completed, checks to make sure the coordination states have changed. Um, and let's see if I can crane my head enough to speed this up for you guys. Uh, so that's, that's actually what it's going through and doing right now. This is just an Ansible job we wrote. We had been challenged, uh, when I had first started at Wayfront, I was challenged by one of the founders who said it wasn't possible to do this. He said, you're not going to be able to automate excluding and replacing the entire cluster all at once. And I said, all right. So we did. So this allows us to do in-flight uh, OS upgrades without um, basically a hit list upgrades. We can just drop a whole new set of infrastructure. Uh, the tooling understands what was new, what was old, and goes through the exclude process without the human interaction piece of it. And at the very end, it um, disables term protection and turns off the instances for us. Yeah, so yeah, that is, yeah, the last thing it does is before um, it does that is it does a sanity check. Coordinators move for both tiers. Our excludes finished? Did we actually exclude the right number of nodes? Um, and if everything passes, disables termination protection, destroys the instances, and then re-includes the uh, excluded IP so that you don't have wasted excludes sitting out there. Um, a lot of the motivation for the tooling was we learned the hard way what happens if you terminate a cluster co uh, coordinator without having a replacement for it. Yeah, which is... Uh, it doesn't work after. Yeah, it doesn't work after that. <laughs> So this, I believe, yeah. So it's going through the cleanup phase now. So all of this is, is really like prime candidates. We have these in Jenkins. They're schedulable jobs. We don't want operators to have to, to remember syntax and have to go in there and do this. This is uh, just a good show for how we, you know, what it looks like, how we do it. Yeah, it's only three minutes, it feels like, you know? <laughs> the longest three minutes of your life, man. Uh, no, really, though, the importance here was we did, as Emerzy said, we did find out the hard way what happens if you destroy your coordinators before you've re-coordinated. The cluster's gone. It's dead. Um, you know, what happens if you terminate your node before the excludes finish? Well, if it's only one, it'll heal. It'll re-replicate. If you don't have enough replication factor or it's too many, you have data loss. Um, so these tools were specifically built to remove that human error, get rid of that element of uh, it's possible that I could, you know, fat finger something, forget to exclude something, forget a re-coordination step. The goal f was to enable future engineers as they join the team to not have to worry about those things and just join without there being uh, any concerns. They could focus on operating and not learning uh, the scary parts of FDB. Oh, what is it? Oh, oh, there we go. Um, I don't know if that went too far or not. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with uh, the FDB trace logs. So this is 
what the trace logs look like. If you enjoy reading XML, I don't. <laughs> um, they're incredibly Spartan, and I actually found reading the source code for Foundation DB lighter reading than trying to grok these. So <laughs> we have a, a tool internally. It's called Wavefront FDB Tailor. It specifically takes this eyesore, and it turns it into this so that we can see uh, this is on one of our larger clusters. You can, it takes and it shows you where the roles are assigned, what machines, what process and port they're on, how much data is flowing through overall on each node and then how much per process so that we can find when there's data distribution issues. Sometimes data is not properly distributed. Sometimes the CPU is hot somewhere and your T logs, which are CPU bound, are going to have some issues. Uh, it shows us how much storage memory is being used how much, if there's any transaction processes, how much is being used. This, this is everything that comes out of the trace logs, but readable. So, uh, which leads to the next point of monitoring, which is basically the bread and butter of what we do. So we, you know, we dog food, we use our own platform to monitor, and uh, internally we have some tools, the, the Wavefront FDB Tailor, and we also have some Python scripts that pull data out and uh, push it up into our monitoring platform. Uh, but instead of really just showing you more pictures of dashboards, I think what I would try and do is just show you like live what it looks like on our platform and how it works. So while we figure out the technical aspects of if this is just going to work, give us a second. So Mike Mitch and the Wafer FDB Taylor at the end will have a link uh, that was open sourced today. Yeah, that's a big shout out to Devon sitting over there and Jay Bell right behind him who put in a lot of work to make that possible. Because um, we weren't sure if that was going to happen by today. <laughs> <laughs> so the big thing in our platform is, uh, you know, we had time series, monitoring, alerts, events tracing, but I think that really what sells me on it and why I love it so much is just how easy it is to see what's going on. Now, this, just looking at it, doesn't look like an incredible amount, but this is actually running a, a derivative of the roles that are assigned. And we can see immediately that there are changes in the rate. So if the role is a log, the value is always some amount, and if that changes, you're going to see a flick on the value. And we can see a big red box. That's an alert that we have cache errors. There's something just broke. So this is how we monitor FDB. We have to know every piece from top to bottom, what's working, what's not working. Um, yeah, there we go. Enhance I.O. cache errors. So we can see which host is dead, uh, which cache is dead. Uh, and so this was the start of an event where we yeah. actually lost an instant store. Yeah. And so, we caught yeah. it right here. So one of the fun things that AWS will never admit to is that things do break all the time in their environment. It is a very ephemeral uh, uh, cloud. Things come and go all the time. Instant stores will die. EBS volumes will go corrupt. Uh, you have to architect to deal with that. So like we put an NVMe in front of each of the EBS volumes. When one of them goes, we have to start stop the system to get an instant store back. We have to rebuild our caches. Uh, but we have the alerts that show us this, and we can actually see the FTB data that tells us that, hey, something isn't performing right. Um, and then here, near the end, you can see a lot more role changes as the cluster is starting to restore order and come back to life. Where is, did it go? There we are. I'll just leave it in this field there. It's kind of funny. So this is more of what comes out of your trace. You can see around 1045 uh, that the latency in FDB starts going awry. We're missing data. It's spiking up and down. The cluster is actually struggling a bit. Uh, the storage and log queues which we had talked a bit about earlier, your log queues 
writing the permutations of what's going to eventually make it into the storage queues. Uh, typically, should never reach above a threshold. And for our configuration, it's about one gig of data. Uh, we can see where we begin to lose out, how much operating space we can see it falling off. This is all stuff that we get out of the, those, the trace logs from the, the tailing system. We pull it in. Uh, we can see where the SSD tier, which is actually this area right down here, the key value store, drops out a couple times. And that is from the initial, we lost a drive, to we had to restart. Uh, one of the other nice things we get is you can see which processes are dying. Uh, you have immediate observability into processes are dying, they're restarting. Those are just memory storage nodes that went down with the event. And there was, uh, they begin the process of self-recovery. This is a very, very durable database. It's very, operationally, it's... It's a challenge. It's a challenge, <laughs> but it's not a challenge because you're trying to, to keep it from corrupting your data like MySQL or Mongo. It's not a challenge because it has insane defaults. It's a challenge because it's so durable that it favors keeping your things together, which means it's going to make some hard decisions for you, which is I'll, I'll, it'll stop the world and recover itself if it thinks it needs to. But the alternative is losing customer data, and you don't want to can't really afford that. Uh, this is uh, actually right. This is one of uh, MRZ's favorite charts. This monitors the file sizes on disk for the transaction processes. It monitors the actual transaction log itself, and it monitors the rate of change in the transaction logs or, or transaction processes as they are as we are recovering and it's pulling data in and it's reading those files back into memory, the processes are growing in size. They're changing. They're uh, recovering. And we need to be able to see that. And that black line right there, which is his favorite line, uh, it tells you whether or not the transaction logs are still reporting out of FDB. If those stop reporting, FDB is hard down. You, you, you have to then go in and do a little bit deeper surgery on FTB. But this is how we can quickly and easily identify and show people, hey, FTB is recovering fine. It'll come back on its own. Don't worry. Um, it's you know, rereading in T-log files from an earlier outage. And some of the other items around this event, you can see we, we track all the metrics because they matter to us. Um, let's see if I can. So you can see in the window when it first went out, our IOQ depth, if you're very familiar with IO, uh, it was not suppressing, which means IO is not being re read or written. Nothing was happening. Um, you can see where we lost it, and it came back, that particular node. So this is all what goes into uh, observability for Foundation DB for us. Um, and without it, I don't know how we would survive, to be honest. And we build alerts on this. Yeah, we do. We actually build a lot of alerts on this. So one of the charts, uh, one of the charts I have scrolled past quite a few times is this pegged CPU process. So uh, what's fun about this chart is so those trace logs are constantly emitting values. Um, and a very important one is the CPU seconds. How much time, CPU time, is this process consuming? Uh, if a uh, particular process dies and it becomes unreachable by the cluster, it stops emitting that value. Well, the FDB log tailor uh, actually continues to emit the last value it saw. So we can abuse this knowledge and write alerts that look specifically for processes that are no longer emitting this data. And we can find processes that have fallen out of the cluster. And they have fallen out of the cluster for any number of reasons. But we can go identify those processes because the rate of change in that process is now zero. And it allows us to nullify all other processes that are showing rates of change and highlight only the ones that are no longer reporting their CPU time. And we use this 
find the process, kill the process, and restart it. FDB monitor goes in, restarts the process, cluster goes back to normal operations. So these are just some of the operational challenges for us. But having those trace logs turned into uh, telemetry enabled us to really dig in and find these kinds of issues where we would typically before be banging our heads against the wall, like, why isn't this recovering? Why isn't this coming back? Um, we built dashboards, we built alerts, and now computers do all the heavy lifting and work for us. And I think that's all I have on. Yeah, I think that's it. I don't know if you guys have any questions about how we do what we do. You want to put yours back on for the last slide, or? Good. Yeah, sure. Actually, I can. So he tries to find the last slide here. It'll have the <laughs> link to the GitHub repo. Uh, or uh, they're, they're posted, too. But uh, the dashboard that Mike showed you, we've uh, exported the JSON. It'll be up on the same repo, too. So you, if you were to try it out, you could experiment with the, the same sort of dashboard that we use in production. I think that's all we got. Okay.